Hi everyone, welcome to the new episode of The Prime View. Today I'm delighted to host Matt Johnson, who is developer advocate at BridgeQ.io. Matt helps DevOps teams to automate and improve their infrastructure security. My first question to you is about your professional background. For over seven years, you've been part of a great enterprise, Cisco, and then you switched to a startup company, BridgeCrew. So why the change? And how has your past experience helped you to do what you're currently responsible at BridgeCrew? <laughs> it's an interesting question. Um, if I'd known I was going to be at Cisco as long as I was when I first joined, I'd probably have asked for a better username. Um, it had numbers and letters and all kinds of stuff in it. But uh, to be fair to Cisco, so I, I joined, I started my career as kind of um, network engineering and kind of Linux, you know, software uh, network engineering. So kind of managing a large uh, Linux server estate. Um, and they were really good at providing kind of new opportunities in completely different areas of the business based on kind of passions and interest and kind of, you know, career roadmaps. So while I was at Cisco for a long time, I kind of had probably, you know, six or seven very kind of different roles there. I, I spent time in like a, an SRE style, um, you know, production facing team uh, managing kind of worldwide data center footprints. I kind of got to spend some time working on developing a ground up um, platform as a service, kind of pre-containers for uh, cloud security groups to kind of reuse that tooling and kind of get into the whole, you know, DevOps uh, style tooling. I spent some time in the CTO office working on kind of new uh, Skunk Works projects around kind of early container orchestration with Mesos and Marathon. And um, and then kind of I landed in a dev advocacy role with Cisco DevNet, uh, which was the perfect blend for me of kind of working on tech and, you know, still being very much involved in, in kind of solving problems and writing code, but then also getting to kind of, you know, upskill others and kind of evangelize that kind of work. It, it was a perfect balance. Um, the thing that drove me away is I've always kind of had that niggle, that kind of, I really want to do a startup um kind of vibe and um i think i got to a point where you know not not cisco specifically but with any large company i got to the point where i wanted to spend more time working on the thing than working on the approval chain for doing the thing so you know when this opportunity came along to do you know a startup with DevRel and open source and security and Kubernetes and cloud. It was just all of kind of the things that interest me in one in one place. And it was too good to say no. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. You know, I've been also part of large organization and now I can feel the benefits of being a startup. So from your perspective, do you feel that the transition was a smooth one? The things that were annoying me about the large organization, like I say, were kind of the meetings about meetings and the yeah. approval chains and stuff. So actually, yeah, obviously it took a little bit of getting used to kind of how much freedom you you have over certain decisions. Uh, but no, I absolutely loved it. It was great. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on some trends, right, in the market. We can see that the line between DevOps, development teams, and operations teams, and security teams is con continues to blur. And it all culminates in DevSecOps. Uh, from your perspective, why we are seeing this trend? I think with where we are with DevOps, DevSecOps is a, a, a must. I think it was just going to happen anyway, because you cannot realize the value of the productivity gains and the automation with DevOps if you still have a manual process somewhere in that chain before things are, you know, all ticked off and ready to go to production. So, yeah, you you know, DevOps allows us to, uh, to maybe deploy hundreds or thousands of times a day into production. But if security is still a manual step that involves something to come out of that automation pipeline, you're not going to gain the benefits you were hoping for from your DevOps pipeline. So I think DevSecOps was a, a natural progression. 
That is a very interesting point, but how exactly does Bridge Crew help developers to automate security? Right, so the idea behind everything we do at Bridge Crew is it's kind of security where code happens. So on that exact idea of the existing pipeline, you know, if we expect a developer to come out of their day-to-day -day workflow, you know, again, that's that's something manual. If there's not the APIs to make security just another first-class citizen of their existing CI/CD pipelines, that's something manual. And at each stage, um, Bridge Crew aims to bring that kind of virtual security uh, team member to kind of aid and help um add those security features to the existing workflow so for example we automatically annotate uh pull requests with comments uh before the ci pipeline's triggered so you know even glancing at an incoming pull request from the community or another team member um another team member will be able to see whether that pull request has any glaring security issues um we then integrate with the pipeline uh, again so that you know just as you are application tests may fail you expect to see failures in that pipeline if there's something wrong so we make sure that all of our security information is in there as well um, and then we also have things like vs code plugins and soon other ides so the the quickest you know non-complicated place to fix an issue is before it gets saved before it ends up in any git commit so we're trying to shift further and further left to make sure that the same policies the same information that will trigger a pipeline failure or trigger a pull request failure is actually surfaced to the development team as they're writing say terraform or kubernetes manifest as well Matt, I saw that you have a great tool, open source tool called Chakov. So my question is, why have you decided to release it as an open source versus having it proprietary? Sure. Uh, yeah. So so it being open source was actually one of the one of the reasons I joined Bridge Crew. Like I've always been really passionate. I've been involved in open source from a, a young age, as I kind of mentioned. Um, and I think, especially around security, you know, it's important to have that um, transparency. It's important to kind of have that trust. You know, we use Chekhov uh, as a as a standalone tool, as you know, that, that that people can can download and use. But it also powers part of our Bridge Crew platform, which is our SaaS platform. And I think it's important to to kind of showcase and and let people kind of get involved and contribute. Um, and also contribution is really exciting because we get to, you know, work with engineers who are using Chekhov for kind of, you know, solving their own use cases, kind of weird and wonderful use cases, you know, and so much kind of collaboration comes out of uh, Chekhov being open source, you know, it's, it's insane to see the kind of community take a tool and just make it infinitely better um you know through through kind of all working on our own on use cases and things like that and if it wasn't open source you know that that wouldn't really be possible so i love the community side of it and then on the kind of proprietary side of it obviously we have a uh we have a SaaS platform and i think they they kind of tie together really well because there are some things and it kind of goes back to that you know build versus buy um scenario that that kind of every company needs to to make a decision on at some point you know yes you could take Chekhov and you could you know you you can put it in your ci cd pipeline to get immediate results so you could run it locally or you could in, you know use our vs code integration and that all is open source um but you could also then maybe extend Chekhov. You could out, use the JSON output format. You could write some lambdas that then went and passed through that and compared it to APIs at you know at AWS or, or Google or pick your cloud provider. And you could do a load of stuff and render that in and start to do you know a percentage of you know what the bridge crew platform does with that open source or if you need all those things you could focus on your product and focus on your deadlines as, as your company and use the the platform you know we support a lot of things that you require um, a permanent uh, compute resource for so for example we 
automatically annotate pull requests. We constantly scan for drifts from your Terraform, for example, to your actual cloud resources. We scan your cloud resources that maybe were already there before infrastructure's code and kind of, you know, apply the same policies to those. So, you know, there's a lot of things that the platform will do that you'd have to kind of build and, and you know, add on to and kind of spend money and resource on VMs or on permanent infrastructure to do. So, you know, I think they they tie in perfectly for two different use cases. Yeah, I heard there are some major updates at Chaco and you are about to release uh, version two of the tool. So tell our listeners what are the major updates that they can expect to see there? Yeah, so really excited about Chekhov 2. Um, the main difference kind of in the back end, we've, we've done a load of um, extra coverage. Yeah, so we've, we've gone through kind of looking at gaps um, for checks against kind of common guidelines like CIS and, and PCI DSS. And so there are hundreds of new checks to start with and new policies. Um, so scanning is kind of deeper and broader uh, just just straight away. We've also supported some new frameworks. So for example, we will scan Docker files. We already uh, scanned Helm templates and Kubernetes and CloudFormation and uh, Terraform and a load of others. But obviously within kind of, you know, Kubernetes style uh, projects, you'll often find the Docker files as well to actually build the containers that, you know, Kubernetes is then deploying. So it made sense to have the tool be able to kind of look at, you know, sensible security practices in those as well. The main change is that we've implemented a graph database for Terraform resources. And I know that will immediately turn a load of people and go, I, do, I don't want to think about graph theory. I'm eating my breakfast or whatever. Um, but we've implemented this graph in a way that as an end user of Chekhov, you don't really need to think about it or know about it, but the benefits are actually really powerful because Chekhov 2.0 now allows us to not just write policies against an individual resource, we can write policies that relate to the connections between multiple resources. So instead of asking, hey, alert me if there are any security groups with, you know, an open, you know, internet access uh, rule, I can now say, alert me to any VMs which have public facing connectivity and are connected to a security group with open rules. So suddenly I can actually scope through those connection of resources to have much more, you know, prioritized results first, because actually a security group, if, an in, if a security group doesn't really matter if a VM has no internet access or no access to the rest of the network, you know, if it's just an isolated uh, VM, the security group is irrelevant. Whereas actually, if I do have a route in from the internet via a VPC or an internet gateway, and then the security group is also allowing any access, that is more important. And through the graph, we can now ask those kind of complex questions um, with a new policy language, which is written in YAML. Um, it's backwards compatible. So all the existing checkoff policies still run in the same way. We've done extensive testing across uh, tens of thousands of Terraform uh, repos publicly to make sure the outputs between Chekhov 1 and Chekhov 2 remain the same for the existing policies. Um, but yeah, we're super excited to see what the community does with this new uh, rule language. Yeah, and I actually hope that you will get lots of new adopters of the tool since you have contributed so much effort to build a robust tool that provides great insights on security infrastructure. Thanks very much. Yeah, I hope so too. Uh, the performance improvements are insane as well because we're not having to do a lot of looping logic. Uh, the graph is actually helping us resolve variables um, a lot easier. So across large... Um, infrastructure as code manifests, we're seeing, you know, order of magnitude quicker performance, which is exciting as well. Yeah, my next question is about competition. You have mentioned several times Terraform, and I was wondering what if Terraform decides to include into their product misconfiguration detection or compliance auditing, would you see this as a threat to your business model? 
and how can you mitigate it? Oh, interesting question. Um, this is going to sound like a really marketing answer, um, but we we do quite a lot of work with uh, HashiCorp and Terraform as partners. So my honest opinion is that, you know, it's a better together story. Um, we actually already have a bridge crew integration and did a webinar with uh, HashiCorp to show how you could fit bridge crew scanning into an automated part of your Terraform cloud pipeline and pull the results back into um, kind of the, the Terraform security reports. So we already kind of have integrations there and it, it, it feels to me like they may have their own security scanning tools, but like I said, like I believe that security is all about as much context as possible. So, you know, we do things like runtime scanning to do drift detection between what's in the Terraform manifests and then what actually turns up in your real, you know, AWS or Google or Azure cloud account to make sure that what you deployed is actually what's running and things like that. And so I think there's always going to be kind of a, a, a better together story to kind of pull more of that context from more places. Um, and I'm, I'm, I would be surprised if, if HashiCorp wanted to go into kind of the runtime scanning, for example, and the drift detection. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna say better together. Recently in the news, right? I could see that, uh, that you've been acquired by Palo Alto Networks. How do you see this acquisition will impact your product development? Since we started our conversation from the point that being part of larger organization can somehow slow down the innovation pace. Is this the case for Bridge Crew IO? Sure. Yeah, good question. And uh, it's I, I joined Bridge Crew about seven months before the acquisition, so it's been a pretty pretty crazy seven months, it must be said. Um, but I have the you know, I have the knowledge now of being within Palo Alto for about a month. And, you know, so far what I'm seeing is is really good. There's an absolute kind of understanding and commitment to, you know, open source, to getting these tools, you know, further and further into, you know, the developer's hands earlier, for example, you know, commitment to improve um, ID integrations, commitment to open source some more of our technologies, which will, you know, plug some some more gaps. So definitely watch this space. Um, and yeah, the, the way we're, we're kind of aligned with Prisma Cloud, uh, who have, you know, application and infrastructure security scanning tools that kind of complement what Bridge Crew are doing, um, especially in the kind of application security space. And from what I can see, they are still very much functioning like a startup. You know, everything is very flat. Everything is very, you know, execution focused. So I'll be honest, for me, it's, it's business as usual. Things haven't changed. Our roadmap is still what our roadmap was. Um, you know, we just have the kind of power of these, like I said, extra context. We can pull data from Prisma, Prisma can pull data from us. Um, you know, we have some really exciting integration points. Matt, thank you so much for your insights and your time. And whenever you're in Lviv, please uh, drop by to say hello. Yeah, I. Uh... We were discussing this earlier, weren't we? It's it's just yeah. not somewhere that it's like, oh yeah, I've been to Lviv. Um, I would absolutely love to. And uh, thank you for having me. It's been really good fun. Hope the uh, hope the weather stays nice for you this time of year. Thanks, Donna. Bye. Bye bye.